we're gonna talk about how to measure the response of a filter using a noise source and a spectrum analyzer. And instead of a spectrum analyzer, you could also use an oscilloscope with a fast Fourier transform frequency display. And I think this is a very interesting topic because nowadays pretty much any decent digital oscilloscope has a fast Fourier transform frequency display. So you basically have a, I don't want to say cheap, but you have a uh, limited spectrum analyzer with, with any oscilloscope that you buy nowadays. And then there are some instruments like this Tektronix MD04000 that actually have a real spectrum analyzer integrated in the box. Uh, but the, uh, the display here is also a mathematical translation from the time domain samples to the frequency domain samples. So it is not a sweeping uh, spectrum analyzer. And uh, in case you aren't familiar with that, uh, back in the days, actually still nowadays, but uh, more so back in the days, your spectrum analyzer would actually uh, start here and then step by step go through the entire spectrum and uh, measure the amplitude um, of the uh, the particular frequency it is on uh, with whatever resolution bandwidth you had selected and uh, you had an opportunity to add something that's called a tracking generator quite easily if your spectrum analyzer was looking at a certain frequency let's say 10 megahertz then the tracking generator would put out a 10 megahertz signal at that point in time also and that frequency of the tracking generator would increase as the frequency that's being measured would increase too so by the time the spectral analyzer gets to 11 megahertz the output of the tracking generator would also be 11 megahertz so you could quite easily put a filter or an amplifier or pretty much anything between the tracking generator output and the RF input of your spectrum analyzer and you would get a response. You would see the insertion loss or return loss uh, in an instant, depending on how you'd hook it up, uh, without having to do much. And that was a very convenient feature, obviously. Now, you can't do that with a spectrum analyzer like this, be it a real spectrum analyzer, like in this MDO 4000, or a standard FFT display that any decent oscilloscope has simply because they do not sweep. They basically uh, look at the entire frequency spectrum at the exact same time. So the only way for us to measure a filter response is to provide a signal that is present on all frequencies at the exact same time. And the closest we can get to that is by introducing noise controlled noise and I got a noise source right here. Um, this is a fairly typical noise source. This is an inexpensive noise source you can get on eBay. Uh, it's a little bit over a hundred bucks uh, but you can get some better, well I don't know if they are better, but you can get some uh, pretty good noise sources uh, from Agilent for instance used on eBay too but you're gonna have to pay big bucks for it. Uh, what's very common for those noise sources is the supply voltage. 28 volts is very typical. Uh, the Agilent noise sources, which are kind of industry standard and came with any noise figure uh, test set, used to have 28 volts on it and still do, so uh, that's why that's kind of the uh, industry standard. And then it has this SMA here for the actual noise output. And uh, one of the most important criteria is the linearity. You want this to be a, a flat response over the entire desired frequency range, especially if you want to use it to measure some sort of filter response, because it's no good if you don't have a, a flat line to look at. You know, if it's all curvy and wavy, you're gonna have a hard time actually determining what is filter response and what's due to your uh, less than perfect noise source. So uh, this one actually gives us a table of what to expect. It gives us a temperature. Of course, uh, any noise source is going to be temperature dependent. And uh, we see the frequency range is from 10 megahertz to 1600 megahertz. And over here is our noise. It's in dB and it's given as ENR, which is very typical for noise sources. ENR stands for excess noise ratio. What this number tells us is how far the noise that comes out of this SMA connector is above the natural 
thermal noise. Thermal noise being Johnson Nyquist noise. I've mentioned it briefly in my previous video on the noise figure measurement. And that is not very much. If we say this is 15 dB above Johnson Nyquist noise, and this is not much at all. As a reminder, at 1 Hz bandwidth, the thermal noise power at room temperature is negative 174 dBm. That's not very much at all. And at 1 MHz, we are at negative 114 dBm. So with 15 dB above that, at 1 MHz bandwidth, it's still just under negative 100 dBm. That is not a very strong signal. So uh, there are some high powered noise sources, but the one I'm using is not. So I have to use an amplifier to get this signal up. I'm gonna use a mini circuit ZKL2 plus. You've seen that one in my previous video. It has about 30 dB of gain. So uh, all together we'll have about 45 dB above Johnson Nyquist uh, noise. And that's a whole lot better than just 15 dB. So my setup is quite easy. I have power right here. Then uh, the output of the noise source goes in the mini circuits ZKL2 plus right here. Got power going in here and the output right now goes directly into the HDO. Let me move this up a little bit so that you can see the screen. And uh, just another close up here. So power goes in here, noise source. Output of the noise source goes in the amplifier. Amplifier right now goes into the MDO 4000. So let's go up and I know the cable is in the way. Let me try to move it over. There we go, that's better. What you see right now is uh, frequency domain right here, starting at 500 kilohertz, ending at 20.5 megahertz. So we have a span of 20 megahertz. And uh, both the amplifier and the noise source are currently not connected to power. So what you see there is uh, natural noise and noise of the instrument and nothing else. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to supply power to the amplifier. And uh, remember, noise is going to be present in that amplifier to begin with. There is thermal noise, Johnson Nyquist noise present, and the amplifier will amplify that by about 30 dB. So we do expect the, uh, the level to rise. And what I did, by the way, let me show that. The spectrum trace that I'm showing here is an average. It's 32 averages because when it gets to noise, it looks very, well, noisy, of course, and this is not very good if you actually want to get a distinct trace to determine a filter shape or anything like that. So I disabled the normal trace and only left the uh, average with 32 averages. Um, that is what we're going to use for now. We're probably going to crank up the amount of averages later. So here comes the power for the mini circuit ZKL2 plus amplifier. And of course, we see a big increase in our noise level. Now we're going to add to the noise by adding the uh, power for the uh, noise source. There we go. And as expected, the level rises even more. Now, how is that helpful for us measuring a filter response? Well, it's quite easy. Now we have a signal that's in a way present on any given frequency at the exact same time. So what we expect to see is if we introduce a filter and I'm using this mini circuits bandpass filter right here. I hope it actually zooms in on that. Um, doesn't seem like it. There we go. It's a mini circuits BBP 10.7. It's a bandpass filter for 10.7 megahertz, 50 ohm impedance. And it mentions the pass band here is 9.5 to 11.5 megahertz. Although it appears in the data sheet that it is a little bit wider than that. So uh, let me get the data sheet over here. Here we go. That's it. That's the bandpass filter. And uh, we have a nice table here that actually shows us the return loss and insertion loss. But uh, we don't want to trust the data sheet. We want to measure it on our own. So all I'm going to do for that purpose is to unplug 
this noise signal and put the filter in line. Now look at that. We can see the filter shape immediately without having to do anything. And that makes perfect sense. Again, the signal is basically present on every single frequency at the exact same time. Now the amplitude varies and that's why I need my averages because again, let me show that. Go to spectrum traces, I'll switch the average off and just uh, switch the normal trace on. You can see that's a mess. If I single shoot that, you couldn't really do any measurements on that. That would be a big pain in the rear. You can see the filter shape, but it's not very useful. So what we really want to do is we want to average and technically we want to average as many average as we can. So let's do 512, hit single capture, uh, single shot capture, and let's see uh, what it does. And you see it kind of smoothens out. It gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. So we can start breaking out our markers here. Um, there are several ways if we click on markers. This is the manual markers that you have right here. And you can have uh, absolute and delta readouts. So um, we want to find our center here somewhere. Let's put it right there. And then let's do delta and figure out where our 3 dB points are. So about here we have negative uh, Come on back, that was a good point. There we go, negative 3.03. Oh, a little bit wiggling around there, still averaging. But that's a good point. Now what I wish this one should be able to do is to just show me my levels as relative as delta and still show me the frequency as absolute. Right now I only have the option to select everything as absolute or everything as relative. So if I want a relative like here for the uh, level, but an absolute frequency, I have to switch between the two. So uh, this is 8.12 megahertz on uh, on the lower side. And if we go back to the data sheet, and I will show that to you in a second. I'm just looking at it right now. Um, what was that again? 8.12. Yep, yeah, that's actually corresponding with the data sheet. If you look over here, uh, 8.2, 3.3 dB right there, that's uh, exactly, or at least very, very, very close to what we're measuring. So uh, let's see where the other side is. Let's get the menu out of the way. So the upper edge is at, oops, one moment, need to put it back to delta, of course. So let's see. Uh, overshot right there somewhere okay absolute 13.18 somewhere around there probably a little bit lower so uh, back to the data sheet 13.1 uh, they have as 5.7 and they have 13.7 as 1.6 db so with our 13 point let's say 2 uh, we're probably right on track there. Seems to be a very, very steep drop between those two. So uh, we're measuring pretty much the same as the data sheet is. And you can see the, fil uh, the filter curve, the filter shape here on the screen is really very clear. It's very easy to make measurements on it. And uh, even though it's noise, averaging it out makes it very, very, very clean. It's very nice and it's pretty fast too. It's cheap, it's easy. And the only thing you really need to watch is that your noise source has sufficient power uh, for you to be able to do that. Like I said, this uh, excess noise ratio is a big catch. If, the, if you would just hook up the noise source directly to the instrument, you would likely not uh, be able to see anything because it's simply not enough signal uh, to see a difference. And of course you want to make sure that the noise source is very flat and that it has output at all for the desired frequency range. Like this noise source is rated from 10 uh, megahertz to 1.6 gigahertz, but I have found that it works much lower and much higher actually, but it's just not rated for that. But it's something you want to be aware of and uh, not mess up your measurements just because you didn't pay attention to the uh, appropriate frequency range for your noise source. 
All right, well, that was just this quick video. Of course, you can you can put other things in line. You can't just you know, put filters there. You can use a directional coupler and figure out uh, SWR curves for an antenna or any other kind of load. You can put amplifiers in line. Uh, you can basically perform any measurement that you could ordinarily perform with a tracking generator. It's absolutely no problem. You do not need a spectrum analyzer. I'm just using the spectrum analyzer because it has very comfortable marker functions and things like that. But you can use pretty much any cheap oscilloscope as long as it has an FFT display. As a matter of fact, you don't even need an oscilloscope. If you do audio stuff, you can use your computer sound card. Again, any FFT display, uh, you can do all kinds of magic with if you have a noise source. Um, there's easy ways of building yourself a noise source. If you're interested in that, let me know. And if enough people are interested, we may talk about noise sources and how to build them. But like I said, the one that I have here, you can buy for about 100 bucks on eBay. And uh, there are other better Agilent noise sources on eBay as well, but you can spend quite a bit of money on them. Okay, well anyway, I hope you liked this video. If you did, give it a big thumbs up. If you have questions or comments, leave them down below. And uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel and see you next time.